Our Father, we praise you this morning. Lord, all we have is yours. These bodies don't belong to us. Our cars do not belong to us. Our houses, our apartments do not belong to us. Our possessions do not belong to us. Our lives do not belong to us. For we were bought at a price, a great price, the price of your son. You redeemed us. You bought us back because we belong to you in the first place. And now we are rightfully yours. Even those who don't believe, don't see it and don't know it, but they are still yours because your word says that every knee, one day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you are the Lord. Those upon the earth, those under the earth, those above the earth, you are the Lord of lords, the King of kings. And we praise you this morning as a body of Christ here at Hope Chapel and those online. We thank you. Father, we ask that you now speak to us, minister to us where we are, minister to us through your word, speak to our lives, touch our ears, my Lord, Holy Spirit, that we may hear you this morning. Touch our eyes, my Lord, Holy Spirit, that we may see you this morning on our hearts that we may receive what you have to share with us, my Lord, and our wills that we may act upon what you share with us, my Lord. For your honor and glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Awesome job. Awesome job. Well, again, uh, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be able to serve you in the ministry of the word. And uh, uh, Pastor Bam asked me to do it a while ago knowing that he was going to be gone, and, and what a day to do it, <laughs> the last Sunday of the year, amen? But uh, as, as we as a leadership team um, have been saying from the very beginning, we want to finish this year strong, and I think I want all of us who, again, were in the production, who had something to do with the production, whether you're behind the scenes or up front, um, and those who were part of the Christmas service, that was pretty strong, wouldn't you agree? Amen. Let's get everybody, let's give God a hand clap. Everybody who participated, thank you again so much. We appreciate you, and, um, and we look forward to more to come. The best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. Well, before I moved here, uh, before we sold our house in California, um, there's a side of the house that that just is gravel. You know, they got the 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 in thing to do today, as far as in California is, is concerned, is everybody's like taking out their plants and they're doing the succulents and all that kind of stuff, and they're putting in rocks and cactus and everything because California is, you know, it's going down the drain with its with its uh, money and the drought and all that kind of stuff. So they want to they want to beauty up their yard and beautify their yard and. And so when we moved into our house, there's a part of the house that's by the front door that's just gravel. And it was actually nice, nice looking. And uh, we had plants set on, on little stones and everything. And over a period of time, if you don't take care of your yard, even though there's a, there's a, 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 a landscape fabric underneath the gravel, stuff starts growing. Stuff starts growing. I was like, oh man, we got to take care of this. Even though we're not selling the house, it looks ugly. We got to take care of this so it looks all clean and neat. So one night I spent like, I don't know, two, three hours, I think it was. Um, I was down on my hands and knees and I started just scraping and with, with my hand with a glove and just, just scraping underneath the gravel and pulling, pulling the weeds out. And then I then I go back over with with my hand and the gravel and that area would look like nice and clean and everything and and I kept doing it I just kept going one section at a time and pulling sometimes I had some major major these stinking weeds I'm telling you they they would not pull out and I was you know, beside myself I was like come on you know and so I was pulling and pulling and pulling and one one of them was right by a light um, and as I'm pulling it and I'm and I'm and I'm and I'm continuing to scrape all the other stuff. The Lord was ministering to me. Does God ever do that to you? You're, you're doing some gardening in, in, in your backyard or you're doing something in the house and then all of a sudden God just comes and the voice of the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And, and God was saying, and this was at a time 
when COVID was was going on. Obviously, we know COVID, um, uh, and and this was probably in June, so it had already been a few months and everything. And and the Lord was just came into that situation as I was doing this, and He was just giving me a perspective. He said, "John," He said, "You see what you're doing right now. You are." You are pulling up, you're uprooting all that does not belong. You're uprooting the grass, you're uprooting uh, the weeds, you're uprooting some strongholds of, of, you know, of, of these weeds that are sometimes by the light, which represents the church. There's, there's some strongholds in the church. And he said, you're, you're doing this. He said, I want you to know what's going on right now. This is what I'm doing. This is my hand over our country. This is my hand over other nations. I am uprooting. I am uprooting what does not belong. I'm root uprooting what does not belong in people's lives. I'm uprooting what does not belong in churches. I'm uprooting. I'm taking, and then, but then I'm restoring. And when I was finished, I was finished with that, that whole area. And the Lord was just saying, John, this uprooting is going to end. But just know that I'm involved. I'm doing this. And I'm going to restore. There's going to be recovery. And it's going to look nice. It won't look pretty. It's not the end all, be all. That's only, that only happens when Jesus comes back. Amen? When He's going to uproot everything. He's going to burn it all. And only those that are pure in Him, those believers in Christ, will be alive. Amen? We are alive right now. So the Lord was saying, you know, John, this is happening. The night is nearly over. There's restoration to come. And I want us to understand and know right now, for this country, for the United States, we don't know when, but the Lord wants us to know that the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So we want to be encouraged we want to be encouraged that God is in control of what goes on in nations. God rises up nations who exalt Him and He brings nations down. And God is doing a discipline of our country. Our country is not a Christian nation. But it is a nation that was founded on Christian principles. People that made a commitment to God to govern in such a way that would honor Him and be a blessing and be good to those that they are governing, to the citizens, so they could freely worship Him. And over time, we drifted. And when we drift, because God loves us, we forget what we made a commitment to. And God starts getting our attention. And I would, I would dare say, wouldn't you agree that God in some ways, all of us could say, in some way or another, that God has been getting our attention? God has been maybe uprooting some things in your life. Maybe stripping some things that didn't belong so that you could be more loving, more of a light, more pure in His eyes, more compassionate, more forgiving, more merciful, more gracious, more devoted to Him. Hold on. The night is nearly over. And I want to share with us this morning, how could we hold on? When we hear the phrase, the night is nearly over, that is communicating to us that the day is almost here. There is hope. Amen? There is hope. Paul, in his, in his book, in his letter to the Romans, the, very, the second to the last chapter, in chapter 15, he said a prayer to, uh, for the church in Rome. And this is what he said. He said, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me read that again. May the God of hope fill you. Now see, this is a word that we need to hear right now. Amen? So let's, let's, just, let's just say it together. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let's break this down. May the God of hope the first thing that we want to understand in this passage is this, that God is the fount of hope. He is the source of your hope. He is the source of my hope. We all have different sources sometimes, though. In this time that we've been going through, God is stripping us of some of that. We have different sources that we depend upon for our hope. Some things we depend upon too much. And they're not necessarily bad things. I like to call them the EFGHI sources. Education and entertainment. Family and friends. Government and geography. Like where you live, location, location, location. It's all about where you live. That's why some people are moving to Hawaii. That's not why we live. We moved to Hawaii. We came to Hawaii because God was saying, you need to come here because I want to use you and I want to be a blessing to you as well. I want to minister to your family. Government and geography. Health and hobbies. Income and individualism. See, some of us put a little too much hope in our education. Education is a good thing. It's a necessary thing. God even said in His Word, He said, in all you're getting, get understanding. But when we begin to put education above God, or at the place where God is supposed to be sitting on the throne, and we are depending upon that as our hope, then things are going to fall apart. Or entertainment. All of us love movies. I love movies. All of us love different kinds of music. All of us like to watch a good Christmas production that was here a couple of weeks ago. You know, or last Sunday, I should say. It seems like a couple of weeks. Man, it's been crazy. But we like to be entertained. But some people take that to another level. And they put a little too much hope and stock that that entertainment is going to give them what they need but it's just going to fall apart. Or family and friends. Ah, this is hard. This is hard. You know, I, 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 it's hard to hear the words of Jesus when he says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword divide, to divide a son from his father a daughter from her mother, a father-in-law from his son-in-law. Ooh, that's hard. Are you saying that Jesus doesn't you know, value family? No. He is saying that you need to value him more than your family. And that's one of the greatest tests. When we first come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest test, one of the greatest tests is when you go to your family and you tell them, I love Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus. That's the first thing that I did in 1992. And I went to my family. I shared the gospel. We were raised in church. They thought I was nuts. They thought I was following a cult and that sort of thing. I said, no, man, God did something in me. He did something in me. But family, the ohana is very important in Hawaii. Strong value. We know that. You guys know that better than I do. But a Hispanic family, that's <laughs> strong. But when that gets placed, you know, the blood is thicker than water. But you know, Jesus' blood is even thicker than that. Amen? So when you get connected to the family of Jesus, connected to the family of God, put Him as number one for your family. Your wife doesn't come first. Your husband doesn't come first. Your kids don't come first. He comes first. And when he comes first, you are the better father. You are the better mother. You are the better husband. You are the better wife. You are the better parent. And God starts to put things in order that were out of order. 
Amen? Because He is the perfect daddy. He is the perfect parent. He is the perfect husband. He is the perfect wife. He is all in all. Friends, our relationships, we think that the relationships are going to give us the hope that we need, but you know friends disappoint. They hurt us. Our family hurts us. Entertainment, education, it hurts us. Government, geography, hello. We can't depend upon the White House. God is the king of kings. The president of of presidents. No matter who's in the White House, no matter who's in the Senate, no matter who's in Congress, God is still in charge. And Scripture says that He can direct the heart of a king in the direction that He wants to go because it's all about His plan and His purposes. And all the nations, Scripture says that God created all the nations in the book of Acts, all the nations together and placed them exactly where He wanted them. You know why? So that they may have an opportunity to seek Him. So no matter what kind of government is going on in what kind of country, if it's an oppressive government or if it's a free government like ours, God is still in control. People are being drawn to Him. And God is using all kinds of means to reveal Himself and to bring people to Himself. Amen? Because God is about His kingdom. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. What did He teach us to pray? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is here, but it is also coming it will finish it will come to its completion health and hobbies this body it used to have a little bit more less fat i used to have a better you know percentage of of my fat content but it's getting i know you guys can all say that you know start sagging in certain places that you don't want to talk about our bodies are getting old Our bodies were not meant to be living this long because the curse of sin infected every single part of creation, including these bodies. That's why we're going to get new bodies. Amen? Amen? Yes, amen. New bodies. So let's not depend so much on our health. Is health important? Absolutely. Do we want to be healthy so we can be strong and have energy to be able to enjoy life, to minister? Yes. Does God want you to be healthy? Yes. But you know what? We're dying. We're dying. But when you have the life of God living in you, you're living more than you're dying. The outward man is perishing. But the inward man, because of the life of God, Scripture says, is being renewed day by day by day. Until we are cooked and ready to come out of the oven. (laughs) God says, ding, 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 ding! You're coming home with me. You will be more alive then than you are now. And then your body will be resurrected. You will be new. A new body. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm excited because I will be with God. You will be with God. We will be with God who is in heaven. So don't depend too much on our health. Always go to the doctor, the great physician first. He is your healer. He is also your comforter. He is also your advisor who can give you the wisdom that we need. Scripture says that the Word of God The Word of God gives strength and nourishment to our body and health to our bones. So don't think that God doesn't care about our bodies. He does. That's why we've got to keep exercising, even though we're dying, right? We've got to keep exercising. But put God first for your health. Always seek Him first. And our hobbies. We love golf, some of us. 
I love to swing some clubs and miss some, miss some balls and go take my hiking boots and go find my ball in the, in the, in the river somewhere. It's fun. We all have different hobbies. But sometimes we can use those hobbies and depend upon those hobbies too much to give us the hope that we need. Income and individualism. I don't think I need to go there. <laughs> Jesus said, God or money? You choose. And then find out which, which one's better. <laughs> which one are you going to depend upon for your hope? Amen? Hope. See, God is the fount of hope. He is the source for everything that we need for life and godliness. Let Him be the head of your life. Make this next year be the year that you decide He's going to be the head of my education. He's going to be the head of my entertainment. He's going to be the head of my family. He's going to be the head of my friends. He's going to be the head of my government and my political views. He's going to be the head of where I live. He's going to be the head of my health. He's going to be the head of my hobbies. He's going to be the head of my income, and he is going to be the head of my individuality. Hope. May the God of hope. Hope is a pleasurable anticipation of a truthful reality. Let me say that again. Hope is a pleasurable anticipation of a truthful reality. When we're depending upon all those other things that are not hope, it's a false hope. It's an untruthful mistake. It's untruthful emptiness. But when God is the source of our hope, when the living God who is present even now as we speak, is the source of your hope. He's the source of my hope. It is a pleasurable anticipation of truthful reality. Because God knows our future. God knows the future of your life. He knows the future of this church. He knew what was going to happen when it happened a few months ago. Nothing surprises Him. But God remained on the throne because He is the chief shepherd So what can we do with hope? What is hope in a simple manner? Hanging on, H-O-P-E, hanging on to promises eternally. Hanging on to promises eternally. Whose promises? God's promises in His Word. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. See, joy and peace. God is the source of hope. He's the fount of hope. But joy and peace are the fuel of hope. Just like this kid, he's just like, oh, give me all the joy and the peace that I want, right? You know, he's actually, you know, the rain or the fountain or whatever is going on. But he's like, ah, you know, that's what we need. We need God. We need, we need more of your joy. We need more of your peace because it's the joy and the peace of of God. It's not your joy, it's not my joy, it's His joy that's placed in us that fuels our hope. Joy and peace are the fuel of hope. The term fill, in the original language, the term fill literally means to cram into a net or make what was hollow full. Yeah, it's like, you know, they, there's a lot of fishermen, right, at that time, and they had a net. When God is, so Paul's prayer is, I'm, I'm praying that, that, that my joy, and, or that the God's joy and his peace would just be crammed into you. Whatever is hollow in you can be filled up. Joy is gladness in the midst of sadness and happiness. See, joy is not an emotion. Joy is a character trait of Jesus. It is, it is a part of his nature that is deeper than happiness. It is a gladness that exudes out of us. The peace of God is tranquility internally in the midst of external chaos or 
external pleasure. Have you ever tried wondering if you have the joy of God in the time of where you're happy? You try, or, or, even, or even wondering if you have the peace of God when there's a, a season of relief? See, it's, it's easier to recognize sometimes the joy of God in the midst of our hard times, in the midst of our night times, in the midst of our dark times. It's easier to recognize the joy of God that exudes in us, even though things are not going very well. It's easier to, to recognize the peace of God when things are not going very well in the midst of the storm. But what happens is, when God takes us out of the storm, then we tend to relax because things are going good. And then we can't decipher between joy and happiness, between peace and relief. That's why we got to continue to press in. Whether you are in the storm or you're out of the storm, you continue to press in because joy and peace are the fuel of hope because make no mistake about it. When we're in the storm and God takes us out of the storm, at some point we're going to be in the storm again and we are going to need that hope. We are going to need that joy and that peace to fuel that hope. But there's a key. There's a connection here in this verse. Joy and peace are the fuel of hope, but as you trust in Him, there's the key. So that you may overflow with hope. May God fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him. So that you may overflow with hope. Trusting God, here's the principle. Trusting God is the function and flow for hope. Without any function, there is no flow. Without any function on our parts of trusting in God, there is no flow of hope. So how do we do that? What is, what is Paul referring to when he says, trust in God? When we trust in Him. A couple things that we need to be reminded of. We need to continue to pray. And I don't just mean just praying for people. That's good. That's excellent. That's necessary. But I mean praying about everything. Everything that's going on in your life. Because prayer is constant communion with the living God who is present in you and present around you. God wants to know your heart. He wants to know how you're feeling when your day sucks. <laughs> he wants to know how you're feeling when your day is great. He says, I'm with you. Just talk to me. Pour out your heart to the Lord, the psalmist says. Peter says, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. See, when we cast our cares upon him and the cares are weighing us down, the cares are filling us up. God has no place to, to give his joy and his peace because we have a bunch of cares weighing us down and God wants us to pour it out. There are times in my family, my wife knows this, my son knows this, when, I am, when I'm weighed down by, some, by something, I will go in the car, I will do whatever I need to do. I will yell, I will just express my frustration to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't like this. Lord, what the heck is going on? Come on, Lord, come on. Why is this happening? Or what's, why is this happening? Or why is this happening? Or Lord, this is how I'm feeling. I don't like the way this person treated me. I don't like what they did here. I don't like how things are going right now, Lord. Because God can handle it. He is your daddy. Daddy wants to know your heart. He already knows what's going on, but he wants to know. He wants you to express it to him. He wants to share your life. And when you empty yourself, then God can place his joy and his peace and his wisdom back into your situation. So pray. Talk to him. Go find a place where you can be alone. Talk to him. If you have to go to the bathroom while you're at work because some, some customer treated you bad, go to the bathroom and talk to him. Whatever you got to do, whatever you can do. Secondly, 
We need to be in His Word. I know we say that over and over and over again. But see, the Word of God is the objective voice of God. See, we want to hear God's voice. We want to hear God speak to us. And God speak to us, just as I shared earlier when I was talking about the gardening that I was doing, and the Spirit of God, the voice of the Holy Spirit was speaking to me softly. That is a subjective voice of God. But the objective voice of God is where we need to be. That's where we need to start to learn how to recognize His voice in life, in circumstances, because He's never going to tell you something that is contradictory to what He has said in His objective voice. The Word. Spend time listening to Him, talking to Him, reading. If you don't know how to read or you don't read very well, listen to the Word of God. You want to hear James Earl Jones in your ear all the time? Narrate, you know, dictating the word of God to you, then listen. Listen, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You're spending time with Him. That's the point. You're not spending time reading a book, you're spending time reading and listening to God's love letter, to God's wisdom, to God's advice, to God's counsel, to God's word for healing your hurts. For God's encouragement, for God's comfort, for God's nourishment, for God's teaching, for God's rebuke <laughs> and correction. Every day, just about every day, I spend time, and that's the very first thing that I want to do before I get my day started, is I want to just spend time with you, Lord. And I, and I, and I, and I sit there, I, I kneel, and I say, Lord, whatever you want to share with me, rebuke, correct, encourage, inspire, motivate, love on, comfort, counsel, advise, instruct, reveal, inspire, whatever it is, Lord, that you want to share with me, talk to me right now as I spend time with your word. Open my eyes that I may see what you want me to see this morning. Touch my mind that I may understand what it is that you show me. And touch my will and my soul and my spirit so that I can discern accurately and apply it to my life. Whatever it is that he shares with me. And then he shares whatever he shares. And sometimes it is a smack in the face. <laughs> sometimes it is a precious word that I needed for encouragement or comfort. He's there. He wants you with him. And then you need to act on it. So prayer, the word, and application. That is trusting in God. Just like this child right here. He is trusting in everything. He is leaning everything off. He's jumping off this little rock right into the arms of his daddy because his daddy can hold him up. He knows that his daddy cares. He knows that his daddy is going to catch him. And you know what? When he trusts in his daddy like that, that child is filled with joy and peace. And that fuels his hope because now he wants more. <laughs> I have more hope in my daddy that my daddy can catch me. Again, daddy, again. Let's do this again. Or granddaddy or grandma or auntie or uncle or whatever it is. Again. See, the joy and the peace of that trust and that relationship fuels his hope. He says, my daddy's going to catch me. God wants to catch you. Will you jump? Whatever you're going through, will you start jumping? Maybe you've been sitting too long. Trusting God is the function and the flow for hope. There's an overflowing. You ever filled, all of us have filled something, some sort of drink with, in the glass. But have you ever decided to just fill it and just let it, just, just let it go? Maybe you've done that in the sink when you've washed dishes. You know, you got a cup in there and the, the, the water uh, from the spout is just flowing down. It's just flowing down and it starts filling up that cup and it just overflows and the water's still coming and it's just overflowing. It's just overflowing. See, when the Spirit of God comes and lives in you, Jesus said that He would be a, a fountain or a spring welling up to eternal life. 
See, as we continue to trust God, we continue to give our lives control to the Holy Spirit, the life of God continues. It's a continual flow of God, the Holy Spirit, both without and within. That's really hard to fathom. How could the Holy Spirit be in you and 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 in me? He is one God. What does he like cut himself in all these kind of pieces to, to fit in everybody's you know, heart or something? I don't know. But I do know that he is without and he is with, within. So the flow of God coming in fills us up until hope, the joy and peace and hope just is produced and it overflows. You are overflowing with hope about your future. Because God has promised, I have, behold the plans I have for you, not to harm you, but to give you a future and a hope. He has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. No one can snatch you out of my hand. He has promised, nothing on heaven and earth can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Nothing. I'm with you in the storm, and I'm with you out of the storm. I'm loving you. Trusting God is the function and flow for hope. But if we don't trust God, there is no flow. If we don't function, there is no flow. We are going to be in despair. And lastly, God supplies the forth, forcefulness for hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything that we just talked about can only happen. Our trust in God, our experiencing the joy and being filled with joy and peace and inspired by, by hope can only happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is why we need the Holy Spirit. You and I cannot live a life pleasing to God without the life of God in us, number one, and the power of God within us, number two, to live that life out through our bodies. That is why we are in constant surrender. My body, my eyes, my mind, my mouth, my feet, my hands, this whole body, everything belongs to you. I surrender. I have to surrender to Him every single day, just as I know you do. Every moment of every day is constantly surrendering. Lord, I'm yours. Lord, I'm yours in this situation. Even though I don't like how this person is treating me right now. I am yours in this situation. Be my mouth. Be my eyes. Because man, I just want to throw down right now because this person is the way, the way I'm treating right now. I want to say a few things and God just take control of my mouth. Take control of my heart. Because I want to say some things that I shouldn't be saying. So that only the fruit of God comes out. All of this is by the power of the Holy Spirit. God supplies the forcefulness for hope. So let me review. God is the source of our hope. Joy and peace are the fuel of our hope. Trusting God is the function and the... What is it again? The flow, thank you. <laughs> Somebody's paying attention. Amen. The flow for our hope. And God supplies the forcefulness of our hope. You see this picture up here. That is a picture of our fireplace, of what used to be our house. And on, hanging on top of that fireplace is my Buena Park Police Chaplain uniform. And at the base of the fireplace is the directory of the church that I pastored. This was 2017, three years ago? Is that right? Yeah, 2017, three years ago. I was pastoring a church in Buena Park, California. That's in Orange County. Right across the street from the police station. <laughs> Go figure! <laughs> My wife and my son and I were pouring into that body. Loving on that body. God was using us to make some major changes 
in that church because God wanted us there. I wasn't looking for that, that role. They wanted an interim pastor. And as God had it, I found out that they wanted me to, to be their senior pastor. And over two years, we were pouring into that body of Christ. We were pouring into the community. We were sharing the gospel. God was bearing some fruit in that church. And then I and my wife and my son, we got blindsided. I was a quarterback in high school. I know what that's like to get blindsided. You don't know what's coming. There was a vote. There was a meeting happening after service to decide whether to keep me on as their pastor. With a list of false accusations. After their service, we go into this meeting and it was like a room about this size and it was full of people that we didn't even know. Or some people that came that used to come to the church and then started coming again because they wanted to see the show. And I stood up. I had my wife stand up. I had my son stand up. When the vote was counted, thinking and believing that God was going to deliver us and that we would be staying. But that's not the way it happened. That was my last day. That was our last day. Seeing my son cry, my wife cry, and seeing the hand, the writing on the wall. We knew what was going on. But we felt betrayed. I felt betrayed. I felt tossed to the side. We were wounded. We were hurt. Those next two months... I was spending it time at home. I was crying. I was weeping. I said, Lord, Lord, have. Take this church. They're yours. Have the police department chaplain role. It's yours. And that started a period of a time of, to some degree, darkness in my life. I was angry. I started getting bitter. Started getting resentful. And God said, I want you to stay at the police department. This was not you that caused this to happen. I'm delivering you from this situation. But it still hurt. I was wounded. They were wounded. I didn't, want to, I didn't know if I wanted to go into ministry anymore. I don't want to do this church thing anymore. I even started sending out resumes. So I thought, okay, I'm done with this. I'm done with this church. I'm going to start sending resumes to churches. I still had hope because I was still trusting God. Even though I was wounded and I was hurt, I was pouring out my heart. And I was sending out my my resume, even to the east coast of the mainland where my parents live. I almost got a church job in Connecticut of all places. But now I'm in Hawaii. <laughs> Amen? I even applied, this is how bad it was. I even applied for a youth pastor intern and got denied. Come on. Don't you have any use for me, Lord? Yes, he did. Because a good pastor friend of mine of a church with whom I met in ministry in the community of a four-square church, a small four-square church, he said, why don't you come be a part of four-square? We need pastors. So I started going. We started going to their church. God in so many different ways, just made it very clear, I want you to start going to the church now. And just don't, don't do anything, just be. 
Just sit. Just be loved on. I was crying during the service. I was crying at home. I was hurt. But see, God was restoring me. And then He gave me a job where I was working my butt off. And it was kicking my butt. <laughs> in, a, in the heat of Ontario, California. And then He gave me another job. And guess where this job was? I had to pass that same church driving to that job every single day. You know what God was doing? He was helping me trust Him to forgive and to pray for that church. I know some of you are hurt. I know some of you are wounded. Church is messy because it's family. We get betrayed. But see, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. You may be struggling in your family, but the night is nearly over. You may be struggling in your marriage, but the night is nearly over. You may be struggling as a parent with your child, but the night is nearly over. You may be struggling with your finances, but the night is nearly over. You may be struggling with employment situation, but the night is nearly over. We're going through a situation together in this country. But the night is nearly over. Worship team, come back up. Trust in God. Let His joy and peace fuel your hope to overflowing. As the worship team plays, I want to give us an opportunity. Uh, Jean, my wife, Linda, I want to give anybody here an opportunity. And as we stand and worship um, this morning, I want you, I want to encourage you. If you need to be prayed for, for something, anything, you're not feeling good. Situation at work is, is struggling. Some things are going on in your family. You need to, to ask the Lord for provision. You need to ask the Lord for counsel, for wisdom, to know what to do in this situation. Come. See, this is why we're here. We do, we do life together. We do family together. Once a week, we're here. We're all gathered together. It's a good thing to be able to enjoy fellowship and ask how we are going, how we're doing. But can we pray for each other? I know you do. I know some of you pray for each other. I praise God for that. But this is a special time where God can meet you in your moment of need to be prayed over to be ministered to.